Welcome. My name is Erin Rogers, and it's my privilege and honor to welcome you to the weekly virtual worship service of Buckman Bridge Unitarian Universalist Church, or as we like to call it, BBUUC. If you would like to learn more about our church, you can go to our website at bbuuc.org. If you would like to learn more about Unitarian Universalism, you can go to the website uua.org. I'm so glad that you joined us this morning. Today, we are celebrating Maban, or better known as the Autumn Equinox, which falls on September 22nd this year. That's this upcoming Wednesday. In mythology, Maban is the time when the god of light was defeated by the god of darkness, resulting in longer nights. In Celtic folklore, Maban is the son of Modron, the great goddess of the earth, who was kidnapped for three days after his birth, making light go into hiding. We will also be creating Ojos de Dios, a common craft for this season, and we'll welcome Reverend Trisha Parker as she presents more about this fabulous holiday of Maban. We will now light the chalice. A single flame, the distinction between dark and light, cold and warmth, wisdom and naivety. As the season marks the blending of these forces, so let us join to harvest the blessing of our own dual natures. All right, today I would like to share with you a craft that is very commonly made at the time of Maban. It is called the God's Eye or Ojos de Dios. There's a beautiful example that I have in my home. It doesn't have to be this elaborate. We also have smaller ones. The Eye of God. It's a very simple craft to do. It was actually, I'll give you a little bit of background on it. It originated from the Huichol Indians in, of Mexico's Sierra Madre. They would bring flowers, arrows, feathers, prayer bowls, and make these God's eyes, or also known as tikuri, um, as symbol symbolic gifts to their deities. And they put them in sacred caves in hope of return of favor and protection. So in this time of the year, as we turn towards the dark, these offered protection during the time of darkness. The Huichol made wonderfully colorful God's eyes from yards, yarns and yarn paintings. And I am gonna share with you how they made these ojos de Dios. So you have two sticks and you can use any two sticks. I went out to my favorite tree and got a couple of branches and made sure that they were the equal length. As a parent, you might use just simply um, sticks from the craft store and glue them together for children who might have difficulty getting started on this. You might think of the four points as representing the four directions or the four elements, earth, fire, air, and water. The Huichol Indians thought of this as a way to connect to God those things that you cannot see. The center of the eye, they would say, is it represents the power of seeing and understanding those things that we cannot see. Now, I would just hold this together and just go around a few times in the middle so you get a good start. Doesn't have to be perfect. There we go. So you get something like this. And then you take your yarn and simply weave around. One at a time going around counterclockwise with the sticks. 
it's a, it's a clockwise tick. And just to give you a little bit more of a view of what I'm doing, go around this way, twist, go around this way, twist around again, twist around again, and continue. It's very meditative. As you do this, you might think of the person that you're wanting protection for or the things that you hope for uh, protection from during this season, maybe for yourself, maybe for your community. And you continue on. See how it's coming along? Now again, I'll show you a little bit closer on the outside. Twist around, turn. Twist around, turn. Twist around, turn. Twist around, turn. Yeah, it's getting a little monotonous. But like I said, med meditative. In a special time where you can put your energy into this for your loved one. After some time, you would choose a different color so that you get the illusion of the eye, representing those things you can't see with a physical eye. And again, you continue on and on. And as you can see in the final product, it starts off like that. And you change your colors and you get the Ojo de Dios. I hope that you're able to see what I could do there and find this project kind of easy to do on your own. Um, enjoy. Happy Mabon. Even though our building is closed, the work of this church goes on. And of course, the church is not made up of just the building. The church is made up of each of you and me, the members of the congregation. We invite you to participate in our offerings. You can click on the PayPal link below, or you can go to our webpage to see ways that you can give there. Whatever you're able to give, we deeply appreciate it. Thank you. This is the time in our service where we share our joys, sorrows, and milestones by lighting flames around our chalice to deepen our community and offer comfort. This week, there are no pieces of our lives to share aloud. So instead, we light a sacred flame for all the joys and sorrows that remain in the hearts of our congregation unspoken. Please join me in a meditation on the equinox written by UU Minister, Reverend Thomas Rhodes. Over our heads, the great wheel of stars shifts. The autumnal equinox manifests itself. And for one precious instant, darkness and light exist in balanced proportion to one another. Within our minds, the great web of neurons shifts. New consciousness arises. And for one precious instant, experience and meaning exist together as revelation and epiphany. Within our hearts, the great rhythm of our lives shifts, a new way of being reveals itself. And for one precious instant, the nexus of the body and the seat of the soul truly exist as one. Let us give thanks for those times in our lives when all seems in balance, for those times are rare and precious. The equinox shall pass, the revelation may be forgotten, and our actions will not always reflect our true selves. But through our gratitude, we may remember who we are, reflect on who we may become, 
and restore the balance which brings equanimity to our lives. Let us be quiet for a moment together. for inviting me to speak today. It is always an honor to share information about Wicca and its sacred holy days. One of those holy days is Mabin, which is fast approaching and occurs on September 22nd. Mabin marks autumn equinox, the balance of light and dark, and the beginning of fall. It is a harvest time, the reaping of our hard work for better or worse. For Wiccans, this is the time to release rest, reflect on how to accept and integrate this year's lessons. Today I will share the structure of our holy days, the astrology or science behind the season, and the traditional maven ritual. Wicca has two different types of ritual celebrations, those that follow the lunar cycle, such as full moons and new moons, and those that follow the solar cycle, which we call sabbats. There are eight Sabbaths that make up the Wheel of the Year. Behind me, there is a visual representation of the wheel. Notice our wheel is divided fairly evenly into eight holy days. The most traditional and older, greater Sabbaths are fire festivals, which include Beltane and Samhain. The greater Sabbaths center around agricultural milestones, such as planting, budding, harvesting, dying and occur every three months or every quarter. The cross quarters, or lesser Sabbaths, celebrate the annual solstices and equinoxes. Remember, Wicca originated in Great Britain, and many of its festivals are centered around the weather and agricultural cycles as they happened in the British Isles. Even though Great Britain has moved away from a dominant agricultural society and Wicca has reached all over the world, the Wiccan Wheel of the Year lives on through symbolism and metaphor. Mabin, agriculturally, is a harvest festival and is a second one on our wheel. In the latitude of the British Isles and even New England, the chore of bringing in the fruits of our labor and putting them up for the winter is an exhausting chore filled with much joy if bountiful or much disappointment if poor. During harvest, the reaper is faced with learning the consequences of many decisions made over the past six months. Will the reaper learn from these decisions? Will the lessons be integrated or will they be ignored? Metaphorically, Mabin is a time of our yearly death when we pass away from the trials and triumphs of the year to reap our rewards and re embrace rest. It is during rest that we reflect on our lessons and assimilate them into our being. I don't know about you, but I look forward to the shorter days when I have a perfect excuse to sit and read, make a puzzle, or go to bed early. The summer days have us outside gardening, vacationing, doing yard work, because the sun just makes us do, while the dark makes us don't. 
Resting allows our bodies to recoup and our minds to percolate. Right now, this energetic shift is being felt more in northern climates, but soon we will feel it too. There's definitely more going on than meets the eye, up in the heavens and among the stars. As above, so below is a maxim embraced by Wicca, and it represents our belief that what is going on in the macrocosm <laughs> is reflected in the microcosm. Again, Maven occurs at the autumn equinox when light and dark are in balance. Astrologically, it is also the time of year when the sun enters the first degree of Libra, the zodiac sign symbolized by the scale, an ancient tool of weights and measures. The scale is a perfect symbol for what we should be doing right now, weighing the pros and cons of our past actions. And because balance is the ultimate goal of everything we do, Libra is the perfect season to begin our self-assessment. The scales must tip in a different direction for, in order for us to grow. By now, I hope you see the importance of having a balance between the restful, receptive, contemplative dark time of the year with the active, projective, energetic days of light. One of Wicca's most powerful maven rituals is the psychodrama of the abduction of Persephone and her descent into the underworld. This ritual was part of the Eleusinian Mysteries, considered one of the most favorite and famous rites of ancient Greece. Persephone's destiny is to live in two worlds, one as the goddess of spring and the other as the queen of the underworld, and to balance their demands. At this time, I would like to tell her story. So please, peer with me through the veil of time, traveling back to a warm, beautiful day. The bees are buzzing, the sun is shining, the fields are golden brown. The harvest is near and summer is ending. Several nymphs are giggling and frolicking through the fields when suddenly they all feel the presence of the great goddess step forth onto the earth. They rush to order and one proudly announces the arrival of the great mother goddess Demeter and her holy daughter Persephone. Such a wonderful feeling runs through the land as the two benevolent goddesses walk among the fields and the flowers. The golden Demeter and the precocious Persephone stroll about enjoying the abundance around them. The flowers are scenting the air and the breeze is soft and sweet upon their immortal skin. How wondrous to walk the earth again. Persephone looks about, staring off into the horizon, not seeing or smelling the nature that surrounds her. Demeter tries to engage her by pointing out the beauty of the land with all the food and the flowers. She hands Persephone a beautiful flower. The daughter breathes deeply as if to suck the very essence out of it and then throws it angrily to the ground and stomps her foot. There must be more to life than flowers. <laughs> Demeter leans over and picks up the flower and several more besides and enfolds her daughter in a warm, gracious hug. Persephone's shoulders slump and the wind goes out of her sails. Suddenly she turns to her mother and we can hear her asking about the flowers and what happens after they bloom. Demeter turns away in sudden distress, visibly upset, her hands shaking and her face turning red. She doesn't want De Persephone to know about death. So she quickly changes the subject and ushers Persephone off to play with the nymphs. Persephone slowly wanders off to join the nymphs and is soon laughing and dancing and swirling about the fields. Demeter's face reveals her fear and insecurity as she watches them play. Mm, there's a slight shift in the air where the nymphs and Persephone are playing. One of the nymphs feels the shift and turns towards the water. She narrows her eyes to see if there's anything in its depths. Laughter soon tickles her left ear and she turns towards the laughter and forgets about the water. The air suddenly shifts back and has a playful feel to it again. It swirls around the nymphs and Persephone, Persephone lovingly. But there is something on the horizon and it feels dark and cold. Hades emerges from the murky waters of the deep, his eyes squinting from the bright sunlight afternoon. 
inhaling deeply the fresh, flowery, scented air. He remembers how long it's been since his last leave from the underworld. Hearing the songs of the birds singing sweetly from the trees, it indeed has been a long, long time. A slight breeze carries with it the sounds of laughter and singing from a distance. Hades follows the joyous sounds to a nearby clearing. Pausing at the edge, his eyes become transfixed upon Persephone, dancing with such grace and an energy unlike any he has seen before. The conversation between Demeter and Persephone runs through his head, but her exquisite beauty distracts him. He traces his fingers over the soft, velvety petals of an open flower. The texture is something foreign to his touch. His eyes move from the flower to Persephone, and he drinks in her beauty. Desiring to complement her every aspect, his senses are overwhelmed, and his typically eloquent words fail him. His eyes meet those of Persephone as he follows her graceful moment, movements. He is the Dark Lord, brother of Zeus, absolute master of the underworld. His mind is made up, and he takes Persephone. Later, Demeter scans the meadow as she approaches the nymphs and curiously asks where her daughter is. Giggling nervously, the nearest nymph holds her hands up, shrugs her shoulders, and denies that they've seen her. Demeter surveys the surrounding area more closely. She knew the nymphs were to be watching Persephone. Demeter wails and implores them to go find her daughter right now and not to rest until she is returned to her. How could they be so careless? Demeter curses the nymphs in a great wrath, her gold and energy flaring brightly as her anger and worry grow. Demeter cries. The agony of the parting tears at the very core of her. For she loves her daughter so much that she cannot possibly continue to bear fruit, fruit while Persephone is gone. She is incapable of such acts within a state of grief. She mourns the loss as all the world harvest dies in the fields. Nothing grows and all living things begin to perish. Zeus hears the cries of the people and the animals. He sees the tormented Demeter not willing to save any life while her daughter is missing. He must make things right if he is ever to have peace again. A deal is struck. Hecate is enlisted to work between the worlds. She is the goddess of the crossroads, the place where decisions to go one direction or the other is made. Hecate is there to bargain with Demeter. For Hades has agreed, for in order to balance to return, that Persephone will return to the upper world to be reminded, reunited with her beloved mother. For six months, Persephone is to be the goddess of spring and stand beside Demeter, the goddess of grain, within the realm of the living. And for another six months, Demeter is to allow Persephone to return to rule beside her husband as queen of the underworld. This is the cycle of balance. This is the wheel of death and rebirth. Demeter's lament is interrupted and the deal is accepted. Life and light have reigned for too long and balance needs to be set right or the land shall grow stagnant. We truly cannot rejoice in abundance without knowing the absence of it as well. To know life, we must know death. Below in the darkness of the underworld, Persephone takes the dark veil handed to her by her husband and places it over her head. She whispers quietly to her mother's heart, a farewell. I will miss you. Do not grieve so and cause the land to suffer. When I return, we shall rejoice. But now I must accept my fate and uphold my duties as queen of the underworld. I will inspire divination and magic and grant knowledge to those who seek to know the mysteries of death. Be proud of me, mother, as I go and fulfill my destiny. Demeter feels her daughter's assurance, and turns to walk away, and begins to sing. Seed and grain, seed and grain, all that falls will rise again. 
Hoof and horn, hoof and horn, all that dies shall be reborn. The Mabon portion of this ritual ends here, but the story continues when Persephone returns to the earth six months later, signaling the beginning of the light portion of the year. I hope by now you understand that Mabon is an opportunity to retreat or descend into our shadow, dark places of our mind, to contemplate the lessons of the past six months and formulate ways to use the lessons to recreate ourselves. So upon rebirth, we have a new array of possibilities at our fingertips. Like the goddess of spring, we plant new seeds and through proper stewardship, our flowers will grow abundantly, beautifully and vibrantly. Thank you very much for listening this morning. I thank you for allowing me to be here and I'm honored. Blessed be and goodbye. Our hands will work for peace and justice. Our hands will work to heal the land. Gather around the harvest table. Let us feast and bless the land. Our hands will work for peace and justice. Our hands will work to heal the land. Gather around the harvest table. Let us feast and bless the land. Our hands will work for peace and justice. Our hands will work to heal the land. Gather around the harvest table. Let us feast and bless the land. Our hands will work for peace and justice. Our hands will work to heal the land. Gather around the harvest table. Let us feast and bless the land. Our hands will work for peace and justice. Our hands will work to heal the land. Gather around the harvest table. Let us feast and bless the land. Our hands will work for peace and justice. Our hands will work. And now it's time to extinguish our chalice. As we return to the world, may we carry the light within our hearts, the warmth within our souls, the stillness within our minds, and the wisdom within our actions. May our harvests be as enriching as they are bountiful. So mote it be.